Before our next speaker, we're going to be have another quick uh, presentation from our meeting partner, Great River Energy. At Great River Energy, we believe that power isn't just electricity, it's possibility. We work together with our member cooperatives to power what's possible. As a wholesale electric power cooperative, Great River Energy is made up of the members we serve, the 28 electric cooperatives that distribute electricity to approximately 700,000 consumers across Minnesota, on farms, homes, and businesses from small towns to the Outer Ring Twin Cities suburbs. We collectively bring affordable electricity to 60% of the state. Great River Energy generates electricity and purchases power from a variety of sources, including coal, natural gas, waste and water, wind and solar. Our diverse mix of power generation sources helps us maximize efficiency and minimize our impact on the environment. We are committed to conserving resources through environmental stewardship, pollution prevention, waste minimization, recycling, and reuse. As a not-for-profit cooperative, Great River Energy has no outside investors to please. Because we are owned by our member cooperatives, who operate right here in local communities, we can be responsive to their needs. When members expressed an interest in solar power, we built a research and demonstration project at our Maple Grove headquarters site, and then used what we learned to construct additional solar installations throughout our member communities. Great River Energy currently owns and maintains more than 4,750 miles of transmission line. This includes a high voltage direct current line from our largest power plant in central North Dakota to just west of the Twin Cities. We also own 100 transmission substations where the electric current is stepped down for safe delivery. Over the years, we've collaborated with other utilities on regional transmission projects. Most recently, we worked on the CapEx 2020 initiative to upgrade and expand the Minnesota electric transmission grid. The project opens new paths for wind energy to meet state mandates and assures that our members will have access to reliable and affordable electricity across the state, now and in the future. This diverse power supply system, the changing energy markets and consumer expectations, require that Great River Energy and our member owners continue to work together as our industry continues to evolve. Together, we help consumers use electricity wisely by helping factories invest in energy efficient equipment or introducing members to new methods for heating and cooling their homes or helping them see how an electric vehicle can fit into their lifestyle. Great River Energy also works closely with local and state organizations to assist businesses planning to locate or expand in our service territory. Our employees do their best every day. They are empowered to create positive change and come up with new and innovative ways to improve our business. Employees help Great River Energy support our local communities, whether through volunteering or by leading local community programs. Together, we create a positive impact in the places where we live, work, and provide electricity. At Great River Energy, our mission is to provide reliable electricity at affordable rates in harmony with a sustainable environment. Member-owned, member-accountable, innovative and evolving, environmentally responsible. Great River Energy, powering what's possible. And uh, GRE actually serves my electric co-op, Dakota Electric, and this week the first electric bus went live, which I call the coal bus, in my school district, so it's exciting for us. Um, one other quick item, don't forget there's trading cards for all the power plants and mines over at the, the registration desk. So. Feel free to stop by and get the trading card for the miner or uh, power plant you represent. Our next speaker will be telling you the story of how the Coal Strip United movement got started, how you can start your own movement, and will highlight things she believes help make Coal Strip movement successful. Lori Shaw is the co-founder and director of Coal Strip United, and Lori is a pro-coal activist that uses social media to educate the public about the importance of coal and coal energy. Please offer a warm welcome to Ms. Lori Shaw. Do. 
Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me here today. This is just an incredible opportunity to come share my story and to meet everyone. Before I get started, I just want to give a quick shout out, a thank you to Aaron Huntimer and Steve Van Dyke for giving me an amazing tour yesterday. We toured the Freedom Mine, the Antelope Valley Station. It was wonderful. It was just incredible to see. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, my name is Lori Shaw. I'm from Montana. I am the co-founder and director of the Coal Strip United Movement. Let's see if I can figure that one out. Okay. A little about myself. I'm a 26-year-old activist. I grew up in Coal Strip, Montana. I went to school there, and it's where I reside currently. I went to college at MSU in Bozeman where I graduated with a bachelor's degree in environmental horticulture science. I actually thought that I wanted to live in Bozeman, Montana forever, but it was proving to be expensive for my husband and I to live there and we were having trouble making ends meet and to start paying off our student loans. When my husband applied for a job at the coal mine in Coal Strip, he got it and that's when everything changed for us. Suddenly, he was earning a wage equal to what we were struggling to make together in Bozeman. Thanks to my, hu my husband's great job, I was able to take a risk and start my own business called Shaw's Pet Care in Coal Strip, which was a success. I'm also able to pour a lot of time into the Coal Strip United movement. Okay. So that is a picture of Coal Strip. That is my hometown. It's a small part of it, but you can see the power plant in the distance. One thing I will point out, it looks, it's kind of hard to tell from looking at it, but the power plant of Coal Strip is actually within the city limits. And a lot of people go, isn't it hard to live really close to a power plant like that? On the contrary, it's wonderful because it's within the city's tax district, so. <laughs> They pay for our water, they pay for a lot of things, and they make the quality of life in Coal Strip absolutely unparalleled to any other small town of its size in Montana. So, what is Coal Strip United? Coal Strip United is a grassroots movement dedicated to making the lesser known positive information about coal, coal energy, and the city of Coal Strip available to the public. There is a negative stigma surrounding coal that radical environmentalists have worked very hard to magnify. We strive to fight against that stigma with positivity and solid facts. There's a disconnect between the general public, especially millennials, and the things that we enjoy as an industrialized society, running water, air conditioning, cell phones, People truly believe that some things like wind turbines and solar panels just pop out of the ground. They don't think about where they come from. We have become too far removed from the sources of the things that we're privileged to have. And that distance is what allows the public to take our miners, our power plant workers, our farmers, our ranchers, and so many others for granted. Coal Strip United has a three-part mission, inform, promote, and inspire. There's a reason that the word inform comes first. Above all else, my goal with this movement is to raise awareness and promote self-education on issues regarding coal. However, it must be said that Coal Strip United is about more than just coal. We strive to be a positive community influence and to cultivate a sense of togetherness here is an example of one of the things that we've done. We've done a video series, which you can find on YouTube, called Life After Mining. The first installation was all about a beautiful crop that is currently growing on reclaimed land out at the mining coal strip. It's called Sanfoin, and it's pink. It makes great cattle feed. But anyway, here's another thing we've done. We like to point out the fact that coal is the original plant-based biofuel. <laughs> We like to point out that when the temperature plummets, will your house be warm? We like to point out that coal energy is power that you can rely on. Coal Strip United has organized trash cleanup days, 
donated informative books to the local libraries, and we have many other community service projects in the works as well. So it's not just about coal. It's about improving our community. Our movement generates funds through donations and the sale of our t-shirts, bumper magnets, yard signs, and other things. One thing we're very proud of is the fact that all of our shirts and yard signs and everything, they're all printed locally by local businesses in Coal Strip. So when folks buy one of these items for, uh, from us, they're not just supporting the movement, they're actually supporting local businesses in Coal Strip as well. So, why was Coal Strip United needed? And why did so many people identify with it once it got going? As the name might suggest, Coal Strip is a coal mining town. We mine coal and we produce electricity with it, about 2,200 megawatts, or enough power for around 1.5 million homes. Our coal mine and power plant are the very things that keep our town alive, as well as creating vital economic contributions for the entire state of Montana, as well as the Pacific Northwest. However, all of this is in danger of going away. To put it in a nutshell, our town is being held hostage by radicals. The Sierra Club and a smaller organization called the Montana Environmental Information Center, or MEIC, have sued our power plant's owners and through a settlement forced them to agree to shut down two of the four units that make up the Coal Strip Steam Electric Station. The verbiage of that settlement dictates that not only can the boilers of those units never burn anything again after 2022, and that includes natural gas or anything else, but those boilers must also be destroyed. Talk about a huge waste of potential. These predatory groups are eager to take a large economic driver away from the people of my city and state without any affordable or realistic suggestions on how to replace what will be lost. I fear for the future of my city, as well as my beloved state of Montana, but apparently I wasn't the only one who was getting scared enough to start standing up and trying to do something about it. In just a year and a half, we have garnered over 15,500 followers, which is pretty big considering the population of Coal Strip's only 2,300. According to our page data, we have reached a total of 4 million people across the United States and even in other countries. This is no small feat, and this is also all contingent upon having a base of supporters that truly believe in our mission, and to them we are forever grateful. So yeah, Coal Strip United is actually only, it's only a year and a half old. We're a very young organization. But at the time of its conception, my mind was consumed with fear and worry over the future of the city that I love. At the time, the news had just broken that half of our power plant was going to shut down. The wound was raw. People were scared. We didn't know what we were going to do. That fear that I had then turned to anger when I realized that the entire, there were entire Facebook pages that seemed to dedicate themselves to attacking not only coal, but my hometown specifically, and the industries that keep it alive. So I thought to myself, it was time to fight back on the platforms that our enemies attack us from. If they can make a Facebook page, then so can I. So I created the page and I reached out to my friend Ashley Dennehy, I said, hey, do you want to help me with this? She said, sure, let's do it. And our lives have never been the same since. When I named the group, I chose the word United because it was meant to be a group in which people from any background, occupation, or political standing could come together under a common cause. Ours is a cause that bridges many political gaps and ideological difference. I mean. After all, energy and jobs are things that just about everyone is fond of. Not only do we believe that we can have more of those good things for the people of our state and country, we know that those good things can come to us through our amazing coal industries. But I understand that in this group, I probably don't need to make the case for coal. 
but I do feel the need to make a case for activism. So here's just a few photos. This is the coal strip steam electric station that you can see across Castle Rock Lake. I took this photo from a kayak. There are some apartments, and that's a little bit closer view. And that is a much better view of the coal strip steam electric station. Off to the left lies the city itself. So with that, I'd like to launch into why I feel, or what, what certain things we may have done that allowed Coal Strip United to be so successful within the short year and a half that we've actually been going. Perhaps there are just too many people that were feeling voiceless. Many of us felt that if some anti-coal folks just knew the other side of the story, they might have something different to say about coal. My sister, has actually seen this firsthand. She follows the Coal Strip United movement very closely on Facebook, and she shares every single one of our posts. Not too long ago, one of her vehemently anti-coal friends approached her, and she said that after reading some of the informative posts that she'd been sharing from Coal Strip United, she was struggling to admit it, but she admitted that she was starting to change her mind about coal. That right there is what the movement is all about. So now, I want to go into very specific things that we've done that I think really contributed to our success. First and foremost, I believe that we formed at the right place at the right time. There was a need, there was fear, there was a feeling of not having a voice, and we filled that niche. Coal Strip United has always had a very well-defined mission. It's always simple, informing the public and raising awareness. We are based primarily in social media. That allows us to grow very rapidly. We use things like memes, very short, colorful posts. It captured people's attention. It was easy to understand. And it, I guess people just identify with it more. Three, we don't tolerate hatefulness or negativity on our social media pages. On Coal Strip United's Facebook page, we have one rule, and that is no name calling and no hate speech. We believe that anyone can make any sort of argument they would like without using insults as a crutch. And we've actually been commended on that rule before. People think that that is a really classy way to do things, so. Um, and lastly, on this page, we don't delete comments from people who disagree with us as long as they don't break our one rule. We encourage open discussion on issues surrounding coal. Comments from anti-coal people help our supporters because they allow them to get better equipped to make their case against those arguments in the future. We aren't afraid to have the anti-coal people comment on our posts because we know we can back up our side with facts. Simple as that. Coal Strip United is a nonpartisan organization. We don't endorse or oppose candidates in elections. We never have and we never will. And I think that um, quite a few people found that a little bit refreshing because too often certain causes can kind of gain a little bit of a political feel, and because we have really strongly taken measures to avoid that, I think people feel like they can almost be a little more included. We celebrate our small victories, and we take the time to thank people who support and help us. The last thing you want is to let your supporters feel like they're getting a little burnt out because the fight seems endless. You have to find excuses to say, look what you've done, look how much, what, look, look how much that you've accomplished. And you can see a real revitalization in the efforts of your followers when you do that. We also reach out to our supporters. We have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. I would say, I mean, most of our extremely active supporters obviously would probably live in Coal Strip, and they do. I have about a circle of maybe around 20 people who are extremely active, and I fostered my relationships with those people over the course of the last year and a half. 
And I know, because of the work that I've done to really get to know them, figure out what makes them tick, I know that during the next legislative session, if there is a coal-related bill, or if there's a coal rally or something like that, I can call on those 20 people to make a five-hour trip to Montana's capital and back me up. Because I've, I've taken the time to make those relationships. And when you roll into the Montana Capitol as a volunteer activist, not paid for what you do, to make a case for coal, that is terrifying to the astroturf groups who have to pay people to show up to rallies. So 20 doesn't sound like a lot, but when they're truly volunteers, it's scary. It's scary to those radical groups. So the very last one that I think benefited us, and I gave it its own slide because it's that important, would be to study your enemies. Study them. Do I want to go home after this and hop on the Sierra Club Facebook page and read through their posts? No, no I don't. It makes me feel like I'm gonna get an ulcer. <laughs> I don't like reading it, but I need to because I need to find out what they're saying. I need to find out what angles they're taking. They say, Cole is this? then I will know how to make a post the next day, kind of refuting that or saying the other side of it. Um, if you don't study your enemies, you won't know how to combat them. We take it a step further with Gold Strip United. We actually pay really close attention to what hashtags our enemies are using on their Instagram, their Twitter, and whatnot. And we'll actually hijack those. We'll use them. So their supporters will start seeing our pro cult posts. <laughs> so it really, it really comes in handy to study your enemies. It can, it can stress you out a little bit, but it benefits you a lot in the, in the long run. Um, one really great example I did this, um, that's me, outside the building that houses the office of the Montana Environmental Information Center. I was standing out there about a month after news broke that half of our power plant was shutting down because that organization housed inside that building had sued our power plant's owners. So I go out there with my sign, I can see him in the window watching me, and I take a picture. And I posted it on Facebook and said, okay friends, I wanna come back in a week and I want a big crowd with me. And they said, okay, let's do it. That office is five hours from Coal Strip, and 30 people made that drive. So that one month later, we had people all down the street. You can't even see the other half of them, but they were all down the street with signs that say, coal powers Montana, coal keeps the lights on, we like coal. And it was an incredible day. It really was. <laughs> it was an extremely empowering experience for those folks who had just found out that they were about to lose half of their town thanks to the actions of the group whose office is inside that building. Another example is we studied our enemies by infiltrating one of their, I guess, events. This was held at a college. It was supposed to be a panel on Montana's energy future. It was loaded with entirely anti-coal environmentalists. There was not any policymakers. There was not, there was not anyone who really understands grid reliability or anything like that. It was a panel of anti-coal people speaking to college students. We found out about it. I got 20 people. Most of them aren't even in that picture. And we decided to attend. And we listened. And we decided to distribute ourselves evenly through the room. I told them, don't sit together. Don't sit by your other pro coal people. Go sit by a group of college kids and just strike up a conversation with them. So when that person speaking at the front of the room talks about how awful coal is, you can say, mm, I live in a coal town. And it's a pretty great place to live. You should come check it out sometime. That was incredible. I looked around me and I saw pro-coal people having conversations with college students who didn't know a thing about coal. And I think we successfully undermined that endeavor. <laughs> but if I wouldn't have been studying their pages of the anti-coal groups that were putting this on, I would have never known about it. So that's that. If you choose to journey into activism, you might find that a little courage can go a long way. And what do I mean when I, when I say this? I mean, it is easy to talk to people that already agree with you, but you won't really accomplish anything by doing this. If you want to create real change, 
for the cause that you're fighting for, you're going to need to muster up the courage to speak to people that you know might disagree with you, to step out of your echo chamber. It's kind of scary to talk to people who you know disapprove or disagree with something that you're doing. I had to desensitize myself to it, and it's something that I still work on and struggle with every single day. It is important to stick to the high road, though, and to never insult or belittle people who don't see things your way. It, doesn't, it really doesn't matter, though, how positive or polite you try to be. As an activist, you will inevitably receive bad reactions at some point in time. If people berate you, good. If they call you names, good. When people react this way to the things that you say, it means that you are a threat to them. It means that you're effectively challenging the narrative that they cling to. So every time someone calls me names or tells me to shut up, I kind of do a little victory dance in my head because it means that I'm being effective. The reactions to what I do have been volatile, both negatively and positively. I've been called every horrible name in the book. I have been ridiculed, laughed at, yelled at. I've been threatened. I have been offered bribes to stop what I'm doing. I have had people burst into tears thanking me for what I do. I have been hugged by strangers. I've received thank you notes from people that I've never met. And I've received the most humbling and heartwarming recognitions from the community leaders of Coal Strip. But at the end of the day, all of these reactions are just that. They're reactions. I am ultimately the one who can decide whether to let them affect me or not. I can choose to focus on the good while learning from and shrugging off the bad. It's my belief that in order to make real change, you need to be willing to do what others are not. And you need to be willing to give past the threshold of what others are willing to give. Whether it's time, whether it's courage. Sometimes if you want to get ahead, you have to play the game a different way than what your enemies are used to. Coal Strip United is a bit of an oddity in that everything that we have done thus far has been completely voluntary labor. Ashley and I don't get paid for the work that we've done with it. And in this way, Coal Strip United is truly a labor of love. I do love my city. I would do anything to help it continue as the vibrant community that I grew up in. Money is just money and possessions are just things, but the feeling of being a part of that community is something that cannot be replaced. Anywhere I go in the city of Coal Strip, folks say hello, they'll stop to chat about life. And those conversations are something that I cherish, but I do see the fear in their eyes when they ask me how our fight for coal is going. These, these people are really tough. They are. They're hardworking, intelligent souls with families to feed and bills to pay. But given the short-sighted anti-coal direction that small radical groups are trying to drive my state toward, how am I supposed to look these good people in the eye and tell them that everything is going to be okay? I tell them exactly what I believe in my heart. I tell them that there is a future for coal and that there is a future for communities that are sustained by the good paying jobs that the coal industry provides. Clean coal is going to be a part of the future. It only makes sense that America, the country with the largest recoverable coal reserves on the planet, should help lead the way, but I digress. My point that I'm making is if you love something enough, it's worth fighting for. And when the majority of your adversaries are all in it for the money, being free of that motivation is a strong advantage that the volunteer activist can take. It sort of makes us the kamikazes of the activism world. <laughs> I mean, truly, my words on the day that Coal Strip United was started were this. If I have to leave this place someday because there are no jobs, no businesses, no life left in it, then I want to leave with my head held high, knowing that I did the best I could to keep it alive. For me, the fear of losing is nowhere near as big as the fear of living the rest of my life with the regret of doing nothing. 
Some people are a little bit surprised when they learn that not only am I a pro-coal activist, I'm also a proud environmentalist. My passion and field of study was environmental horticulture science, and I'm proud to say that plants and animals are my whole world. However, I believe that if you want to sacrifice your prosperity and standard of living for Mother Earth, that should be your choice, not someone else's. We're all children of the Earth. We get our very lives and sustenance from the Earth. One of the inescapable laws of life is this. To live is to consume. Just like any living thing, if denied the ability to consume, a society will wither and perish. The goal of responsible consumption is something that I think all Americans can agree on. Responsible consumption means that you take only what you need. And right now, this country, this world, needs more, not less. To deny the people of America the ability to utilize their resources to sufficiently sustain themselves is unethical. Whether it be through heavy-handed regulation or through the efforts of radical groups, to deny the people of the ability to utilize their resources like coal is the same thing as taking the food off their tables and the shoes off their feet. It's time that America's people join our list of top priorities for preservation. The time is now. Right now, there are communities just like Coal Strip, all across the country that depend on resource industries that are under attack by groups that operate under the guise of environmentalism. Their sue and subtle litigation tactics are designed to weaken their victims by keeping them on the defense and bleeding them financially in order to make their services less profitable. But it is my belief that these radical organizations like the Sierra Club and the MEIC cannot hide or run away from the suffering that they are causing in these communities. They'll eventually need to come to terms with and answer for the damage they are doing. But only if we stand together, only if we raise our voices and fight back. And it isn't just coal that's under attack. If you work in any extraction industry, and you don't think that these groups can eventually take everything away from you? I'm sorry, but you're wrong. In the eyes of these groups, the industry that employs you is easy money. The only thing you can do about it is start fighting back by challenging the narrative that they're putting out there. And you have to do it on the platforms that they're using. I mean, you can put, a, put an ad in the newspaper, but if you're not using platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of that, then you're just not going to reach the audience that your enemies are currently speaking to. So speaking of stepping out of your comfort zone, this is a hearing room up at the Montana legislature, and the people featured in those photos had never set foot in the Capitol before. These are two of the people that I fostered relationships with, and they took a leap of faith to stand up for coal and they went and testified in front of the Senate Energy Committee for the very first time in their lives. And it was worth it. They made a big impression that day. I was never trained in activism. If I didn't know something, I would simply surround myself with people who did. It turns out that you don't need any qualifications to start or join a grassroots movement. All you need is a cause and the will to fight. As the title of my presentation suggested, activism truly is for everyone. And there is so much to fight for. Pick a cause and give a little of your time to it. I can guarantee that it will give a lot back to you. It is incredibly rewarding to stand up for something that you believe in. And I think, I've, I've said this before, but I think that it's safe to say that at the end of their lives, very few people lie on their deathbeds wishing that they would have spent less time fighting for the things that they believe in, right? If anything, it's more. <laughs> something that I think everyone here today should ask themselves is if not me, then who? No more waiting, no more talking about it. 
If you want to help make a change, it has to start today. Not tomorrow, not next week, not when you have more time, not when you feel like it. Today, when you leave here today, get on your phone and make one post or even one comment somewhere defending coal, defending something you believe in. Heck, you can even do it right now. If you get on your phone while I'm talking, I won't be offended. <laughs> because if you join the effort to start pushing back, you will be making a difference. And finally, for my very last slide, I want to show you one of the greatest photos that I have ever taken. It happens to feature my gorgeous sister and her husband and their son, Max. This was taken at that peaceful uh, demonstration outside of the MEIC office. This is my greatest photo because it epitomizes everything that Colstrip United stands for, the very reason that I chose the life of the activist. Families, hardworking folks that put in long hours to pay their bills and put food on their tables. They are people, not numbers, and they are the reason why the fight for coal is worth it. I want my nephew, Max, to grow up and become an adult in a world where he can actually afford to pay his bills. A world that embraces advancement in our most reliable, affordable, and profitable technologies instead of clinging to fantasies fueled by subsidies. This is one of my favorite pictures because every time I look at it, I'm reminded of why the future is worth fighting for. So with that, I thank you for listening to me today. Does anyone have any questions for me? No? Hi. Uh, I guess I was just wondering for the rest of us, how do we follow or how do we link up to the Colstra United? Oh, wait. Oops. There, that one. So Colstrip United can be found on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube page has a lot of videos that we've done, informational videos. And we can you can mail, you can mail us questions, letters, comments, anything you want at that uh, mailing address there. I don't know if you have any slides of these, but how about uh, your memes that you that you put out on uh, social media, can you talk about those a little bit? The memes, the memes, memes are so much fun because they engage people of all ages. Memes are so simple. If you want to get an idea across to someone in a very simple way, try making a meme. Just make sure you use the right context. Like memes mean different things. Um, well, like for one example, we decided to point out the fact that the Montana Environmental Information Center is robbing Montana of economic opportunity one lawsuit at a time. So we took their logo and we put the little hat on it. Have you ever heard of the, the, the little hat from, um, it's called, the meme is called Scumbag Steve. <laughs> so we put the hat right on the logo and we said, the MEIC, robbing Montana of economic opportunity, one lawsuit at a time. And people loved it, they thought it was so funny. We kept it in context of that already existing meme. People liked it because they recognized it. They're like, oh, it's one of those, that's great. So um, you can see a lot of those on our Facebook page um, if you scroll back through our photos. We got one, oh, got one back there. Do you have any plans to open a North Dakota chapter? Oh gosh, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? <laughs> well, it's, it's been awesome to come out here and meet everybody. If you guys ever want to come out to Coal Strip and chat with us, we'd be super stoked to have you all. And do you accept tips or donations on your website? We, do, we, we are not able right now to accept donations on our website. We're working on that. Um, the best way, if you would like to donate to the Coal Strip United Movement, is to send it to that mailing address on, uh, on the slide there, P.O. Box 654, Coal Strip, Montana, 59323. Um, 
that's the best way right now. Um, what we're actually working on right now is being able to sell our Coal Strip United t-shirts on our website. Um, so watch for that, because that might appear hopefully within the next few months. I, w I was curious, how do you, I'm the father like of three millennials, and how do you counter the argument I'm sure you hear all the time that this is just to save your town or your jobs, but you're going to destroy the environment mm -hmm. with CO2 or whatever. How do you counter that argument to those young people? To the young people? Well, I think it's really important, um, as it's already kind of been mentioned earlier in an earlier talk, that um, especially in a school setting, um, students are kind of given the wrong idea about coal, and they're kind of given the idea about coal that existed maybe 30 or 40 years ago. The best thing to do is to bring up the fact that technology in coal and coal energy, coal mining and coal energy has advanced very quickly. Um, if you're talking to young people, something that you should let them know is that not all energy sources are created equal. Maybe try to very simply explain the difference between intermittent and baseload energy. I know that's kind of getting in the weeds, but um, I guess it's if you break it down into something that's there all the time versus something that comes and goes maybe they can understand that having a reliable source of energy is really important. Um, I would also put it in perspective, bring up a person that may be having trouble right now, with the way things are right now, having trouble paying for their energy bills. Think about a little, a little old lady who currently has to choose between her medication and her heating bill, and winter's coming. And then ask what would happen to her if her power bill went up by like a third or doubled. That's the way you can think about how, how the price of energy matters so much. I was actually sitting on a panel not too long ago, and it was one of those loaded ones where I was the only pro-coal person there. And I had a guy sitting next to me that said, you know, in my, my mind, it's, it's really not a bad thing if we do things that cause the price of electricity to go up. It encourages innovation. I was so shocked by that answer that I actually went, oh, like in front of everybody. <laughs> because those of you that know that the price of electricity can directly, strongly impact people's lives, know that when you jack up the price of electricity, some people are going to have to make those really important choices like medication or heating bill. So yeah, I think that would that'd be another good way to get in perspective. Um, back, back a little bit more to the subject. Um, if any of you are currently not trying to reach out to the schools that your kids or your grandkids are going to, I would suggest it. You say, hey, have you guys ever um, had your senior class students come out for a tour of the mine before to see it for themselves? Um, I'm actually fighting that battle in Coal Strip right now. Great example, when I lived in a coal town. I grew up in a coal town, but when I graduated high school in Coal Strip, Montana, I didn't know what a drag line was. I didn't know what a megawatt was, and probably the worst part is that I didn't care. I was not, I was not educated, so I went to college to pursue an environmental horticulture degree. And you can imagine the dialogue that I heard around me surround, like about coal, Montana coal. I actually sat in one class where a professor put a picture of my town, Coal Strip, with the Coal Strip Steam Electric Station, and he started talking about how terrible it was. 18-year-old me sat there and said nothing. I'm sure he wasn't expecting to have someone from Coal Strip in the room to actually refute what he was saying, but I couldn't say a word because I wasn't educated on the subject. I didn't know where I came from at that point. So if we can try to approach the schools and say, hey, I saw that you, you have this um, renewable energy program where you guys are working on solar panels or learning about solar panels, do you guys want to come work, uh, learn about a mine? Do you want to come learn about a power plant? Try to have a presence, because if you don't, they're just going to ignore you. <laughs> Hopefully that, did that answer your question at all? Yay. <laughs> Anything else? Oh. H having relatives that live in Coal Strip and work for the power plant, I've kind of followed your story um, since your inception. Question I have is, when you started until now, Talon has reversed their decision and decided to stay on as the managing uh, partner of the plants. How much of an impact in that decision was started by you, do you believe? Oh boy, I don't, I don't think I can take credit for that. Um, 
we have been, we've just been trying to increase morale in the town for a big part. Um, I think that perhaps the amount of statewide attention that we have garnered on the subject of coal and coal strip maybe, maybe helped. I mean, because of the efforts of Coal Strip United and how rapidly we've grown, we've quickly become the, like, the go-to for all candidates in an election. Because we're nonpartisan, we talk to every single one of them. And so in the last special election, coal was like in the forefront. It was great. It was awesome. Um, so I halfway wonder if maybe the increase on inattention on the issue might have helped. Um, definitely the decision of Talon to remain as an operator at the power plant was wonderful. Um, it was some much needed good news. And I take it as a very good sign. Anything else? Any other questions? One more. Hey, Laurie, I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, how do you interface with the Montana Coal Council, if at all? Montana Coal Council is so helpful. We actually ask them for stats and information all the time. Um, I correspond with, uh, with them quite frequently, and they have been a big help in the past for, you know, when we first got started, we didn't really know what we were doing. I would approach them and ask them for advice on certain things. Um, in one of the pictures I had shown you, uh, in one of those groups where we had infiltrated that anti-coal event, the Montana Coal Council really helped in spreading the word about that because they're based in Helena as well. So, um, yeah, we, we do talk with them quite a bit. Anything else? How do you combat the argument that coal is dirty? And you, you talked about the, uh, the price of it, uh, energy going up, but how do you actually deal with the issue that uh, the media and many uh, the young millennials believe that coal is dirty and is killing the environment? Mm -hmm. I like to talk about how far we've come within the last few years, or 30 years actually. Um, most of you in this room probably know the stats that you know in the last 30 years, like around 15 different clean coal technologies have been implemented to help reduce major emissions by 92%. And that was just in the last 30 years. Think about how much farther we can go within the next you know, 20, 40 years. I like to try to put it in perspective like that when someone says coal's dirty. Another thing that I do is I just simply say, please come and check it out. Will you let me give you a tour of Coal Strip? Because a lot of the people that I hear this coal is dirty from have never seen Coal Strip. They've never been there. They're taking someone else's word for it. And it's a little hard to get out there. We're not close to the interstate, so you have to drive a little ways to get out there. But I, I have been successful in convincing a few of the coal is dirty crowd to come see, and they have been shocked that our skies are blue, they're not gray, my, our mine is beautiful, it's reclaimed, it's gorgeous, it's not open pits and gray skies. Um, so between the, putting, putting it in perspective from where it's been to where it is now and where it could go, and asking them to come see it for themselves, those two things I, I think are probably one of the strongest. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Good. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you, Lori. We need probably 25 more of you um, <laughs> over the next several years. Um, we're now going to take a quick break and then have lunch. So feel free to um, network with folks and then move into exhibit hall B next door and find your place for lunch where we'll have uh, lunch, obviously, and a, a program and awards, so thank you. <laughs>